All right, thank you, Ghislaine, and merci, Leila. It's great to have you all here uh, discuss a truly fascinating subject. As our global population continues to grow with the impacts of climate change and the consequences of an expanding environmental footprint on land and water, there's no doubt we must focus our attention urgently to the future of food. And I can't think of a better way to fill my lunch hour discussing with our panelists, Nate, Kate, and Bill. Now, before starting with my questions, I'd like to invite the audience members to post their questions in the chat. We'll have someone um, monitor it, and we'll try to field some of your questions as best as we can uh, during the session. So um, let me start with Nate. Um, so I understand you're an entrepreneur in residence at the Blue Horizon um, uh, a, a venture cap fund to support the movement towards a more sustainable food system through innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. So let me ask you, when you meet a new food, the food tech startup uh, in this space, what comes first? Do you prefer seeing the pitch deck or tasting a food sample? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I personally and Blue Horizon are in this for the impact of uh, transforming the, the food system. And we get that impact through creating, su supporting entrepreneurs who create products that can compete on the, the basis of taste and price with, with conventional animal products. And, you know, that's not something that you really stumble into. We've had, had products like tofu and tempeh, which are great for a small subset of the population, but it wasn't until more recently that we developed, you know, plant-based meat alternatives that could, could appeal to the masses. All that to say, um, we're really focused on the kind of technology components that make that possible. And so uh, we're investing, at least my team at Blue Horizon is investing really, really early stage, sometimes as early as person with an idea or something coming right out of a lab. So we don't really expect there to be products uh, or samples available, especially if you're, you know, cultivated meat or uh, we, you know, work with a lot of B2B companies that aren't necessarily even, even selling a consumer good. Uh, another reason why pitch deck is more important is that V1.0 of products doesn't really matter all that much because, uh, you know, we're, we're iterating on, on new versions pretty much multiple times a year. If you look at the, or if some people might remember tasting some of the really early Beyond Meat products that honestly were not very good, but now they're, they're incredible and they're getting better, you know, once or twice a year. So we're really looking more about, you know, what's the team, what's the underpinning technology, is there any evidence of traction or market pull that that whatever they're doing is going to solve an issue in the industry or or find a way to compete to a new subset of customers? That's kind of uh, more what we're looking for. Okay, great to know that you're interested in meeting early stage companies even before um, they they may have samples for you to taste. Um, I have another question for you. According to a study from the Boston Consulting Group and Blue Horizon, uh, your investment company. Um, by 2035, every 10th portion of protein consumed is very likely to be alternative. Can you explain to us what alternative protein means? For instance, which primary sources can lead to alternative proteins? Yeah, as I kind of mentioned, we think of alternative proteins as true alternatives to meat, eggs, and dairy, so conventional animal agriculture products uh, that can compete in terms of function nutrition, uh, mass appeal. So we're not really talking insects or, or tofu, though there will certainly be important parts of, uh, you know, in some parts of the world of some consumers. Uh, when we're talking about those projections, it was specifically plant-based, um, uh, animal cell-based, and fermentation. So just, I, I know Bill and, and Kate could talk about the first two much more intelligently than I can, but plant-based is just, you know, we can make meat, eggs, and dairy uh, from from plants at you know at the molecular level, all of the same things exist in, in both kingdoms, and we just need to figure out a, a technical solution there. Uh, animal cell based. Okay, we'll talk more about that, but we can just take the cells directly from from the animal or or the mammary gland cells in the case of milk, and we can use that to produce the the actual proteins or fats, whatever, whatever we want. And then kind of the third area that I'm probably most uh, most um, well positioned to talk about for this panel is fermentation. So that's the use of microbes, mycelium. Uh, so things like, you know, bacteria yeast to produce very specific functional ingredients or to modulate plant proteins or to create uh, biomass for products. But it's really all about 
uh, recapitulating the, the, the taste and price um, of, of animal-based products is, is alternative proteins. Wow, that all sounds very futuristic and straight out of science fiction. Uh, but my understanding is that the food revolution is already happening. Um, so, so Kate, being a cultivated protein expert for the XPRIZE, you're up to date on the latest food technology developments. Can you tell us more about cultivated meat? And are we already eating it? And where? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we are not already eating it. Um, <laughs> cultivated meat is still very novel and very hard to make. There have been very limited tastings here and there. Um, is my tech breaking up? A little bit. We're, we're having a little trouble with the, the connection. Anyway, I'm going to continue. Hopefully it's all good. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so I'm going to turn my uh, camera. Is that better? Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. So, so go ahead. You were telling us about... Okay, great. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. So we... Go ahead. <laughs> All right, all right. So, yeah, so I was telling you all about cultivated meat. So, cultivated meat. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Yeah, we're still, uh, we'll, we're still breaking up a, a little bit. So, you know what? Um, I'll come back to you, Kate. Let me turn it over to Bill and ask, ask you this. As, as the CEO of Protein Industry Canada, you're leading the plant based protein revolution in Canada. For those that are unfamiliar with, uh, with that organization, can you tell us more about Protein Industries Canada and why the Canadian government chose proteins to be one of the five innovation super clusters? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thanks, thanks for having me on. This is really an exciting conversation. So Protein Industries Canada, we're, we're what's called an innovation super cluster. And, and you know, that, that's a big word, but at the end of the day, Really what we're driving at as we're an economic development agency for Canada, and I'll come back to, to the beautiful space that we operate in, which is when economic development coincides with, you know, food security and environmental health and, and human health safety. But, uh, you know, the, the backdrop to what we're doing here at Protein Industries Canada is really to grow the, the, the value-added processing sector in Western Canada, we produce on average 60 million metric tons of crop production on an annual basis. And so for people who are not familiar with agriculture, that, that's a lot of crop production, the vast majority of which we export as whole seed to other jurisdictions around the world that are turning those crops into food products and ingredients. Our goal is to process more of that at home so we can supply ingredients and food products to the world. You know, the Boston Consulting Group uh, study that, that, that you've mentioned, or we, we've recently done some work with Ernst & Young, we know that the market's going to be measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars by 2035. And uh, we've got an opportunity to capture a significant portion of that in Canada and, and help solve some of the issues related to climate change and uh, redesigning of food systems and addressing human health concerns. So why did Canada choose uh, plant-based protein as one of the five innovation superclusters? You know, agriculture and food is the, the largest employer already in Canada. It is the second largest contributor to GDP. Canada is one of the five global jurisdictions of the net exporter of food. And we've got billions, billions of dollars of value locked up inside of the crops that we produce on an annual basis. So it's a very exciting time. And I, I you know, I come back to the intersection between economic development for growth for the country and um, being able to really address some of the global challenges in our food system. That's, that's great. And when you think of Canada, you always think of, the, of it being the food basket of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's great to, uh, it's great to realize that uh, Canada can also be the future food basket of the world. So that's, that's amazing. I'm going to check back in with Kate and see if we have um, a better connection and, and revert back to our, our question with Kate. Kate, are you, are you with us? No, 
Okay, so let me uh, let me go back to you, Nate. Um, you mentioned the third source of alternative proteins based on microorganisms uh, or fermentation based. Can you tell us more about that? Why why is it revolutionary? And can you give us a couple of examples? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll first talk about kind of the examples and the types, and then I think why why I think this is going to be so revolutionary. And, um, you know, keep in mind, this is just, uh, this categorization system was developed based on the first, you know, 50 or so companies in the space that, that are operating as, you know, fermentation alternative protein companies, but certainly there will, there'll be many more and categorization, categorizations will shift, but we think of uh, fermentation as three categories. There's traditional fermentation, biomass fermentation, and precision fermentation. Traditional fermentation is just leveraging, you know, the, the indigenous knowledge of, of using microbes to bioprocess different plant or, or even meat ingredients. So things like uh, cheese is, is a traditionally fermented food, many kinds of cheese, uh, kimchi, leavened bread, uh, you know, all, all that kind of stuff is traditionally fermented. Now there's a handful of companies that are taking that, that type of uh, approach to bioprocessing meat. So one, one great example here is Myco Technology, which is a Colorado based company that, uses shiitake mushroom mycelium. So, so not even, not even a, a, a microbe or a bacteria, but, but uh, mushroom mycelium to ferment in solid state rice and pea. And so you can get kind of like a, uh, a, a really nice bioprocessed uh, beef product analog that has you know, high protein because micro, uh, fungi consume the carbohydrates, convert them to protein. Another example that's in the in the Blue Horizon portfolio is New Roots. So basically swap out the dairy cream for, for nut cream and you can ferment it into cheese. So that's traditional fermentation. Uh, it, it doesn't sound super technical, but it's really excited and, and maybe uh, one, one of my favorite areas in the entire all protein industry. The second area is biomass. So that's the use of basically the use of the microbe or the mycelium as the the main ingredient or the biomass or the protein source in a product. The classic example here is corn, which is a UK based brand that uses a filamentous fungi strain to create a meat analog. There, there are other companies in the space like Wild Earth that makes pet food, uh, Atlas Food Co, which uses mushroom mycelium to create whole cut uh, muscle analogs like bacon. Lots of really exciting work there. Um, there are companies using microalgae as well, like Algama. The third area is precision fermentation, which is where we have most of our investments, but I don't necessarily think it's, it's uh, any better than the other two categories, but this is the use of, of microbes. Most often it's gonna be a yeast or, or a bacteria to produce a very specific functional ingredient that we then purify out of the cell. So this is like uh, how, we, how we've been using it in the pharma sector for, for a number of years, like you know, how we created insulin from, from yeast instead of pig pancreases. So, Classic example there would be Impossible Foods derives their the heme that gives their, their product the bloody taste. They pull that uh, they they pull that out of a, a yeast. There's uh, Clara Foods which creates egg real egg proteins via fermentation. Gel tour real collagen proteins via fermentation. Really, you can create anything uh, that that you can dream up through precision fermentation. So there's a lot of activity uh, in this space as well. Why it's revolutionary. Uh, three main areas, probably human health, animal, planetary health, and economic efficiency. So just briefly on those, there's some preliminary evidence, even though this is a relatively new area, that uh, fermentation dry products are, are really healthy. Those traditional products have a health glow for a reason, but even some of the newer products like biomass um, are, are shown to have really high PDCAS scores. I, I know Exeter last year did a study that showed that the the corn mycoprotein, so the, the fungi protein that corn uses, uh, was more effective at building muscle than was uh, dairy milk proteins. So a lot, a lot of interesting human health implications there, especially when it comes to addressing malnutrition. Uh, animal and planetary health fermentation allows us to decouple protein production, both from, from animal agriculture and land use. So really great for uh, you know, uh, ensuring biodiversity continuing or or uh, you know, keeping supply chain secure, removing animals and, and all the issues associated with that. And then just thirdly is economic efficiency. Um, you know, we can convert really cheap, 
feedstocks into high quality protein and formats that people want to eat uh, without having to funnel it through an animal, which is thermodynamically a disaster. So, you know, we can use CO2, methane, sunlight, wood pulp, uh, corn stalks, corn sugar, lots of different things that we can basically turn to, to things that we, we want to eat. Fantastic. Therm thermodynamically disastrous. I'm, I'm going to keep that one. <laughs> and uh, I, I've, I've, uh, when I was uh, uh, working on my, my own uh, food tech startup, uh, micro technology was front and center, but it's, it's unbelievable um, how vast and, and wide and expansive it is. So it's, it's really fantastic. Uh, thank you for, for that. Um, let me check in with Kate. I, uh, do we have any luck with Kate? All right. Well, um, so, so, Hello. so hopefully oh, you can okay. hear me now. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, well, yes, we can. So let me get uh, quickly to uh, your question, Kate. <laughs> hopefully you, we can fit you in. Um, so, so my understanding is you're a cultivated protein expert for the XPRIZE and you are up to date on the latest technology developments. So can you tell us more about cultivated meat and, and what, what it is and, and, you know, is it as delicious as, as my steak? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great question. So first of all, I'm going to say I have not tried cultivated meat yet, so I cannot personally comment. That's, I think, one of the main misconceptions about cultivated meat is uh, its availability. So in general, uh, it's very hard to find cultivated meat. Just Foods was the first company to really do any kind of a large scale public release, extremely cutting edge. So XPRIZE is looking to do the first um, development of what's called a structured meat product. So something that includes um, a full cut of chicken or a full filet of fish. The goal is to get uh, a product that not only has uh, animal muscle cells, but also that has a bite or a mouthfeel like a meat product. So cultured meat involves taking animal cells directly from an animal, as uh, Nate mentioned, growing those cells uh, in cell growth medium, growing those cells in such sufficient quantities that you can uh, incorporate them directly into a food product. Uh, these days that mostly looks like a chicken nugget, quality plant protein. Um, but as we move into the future, we're going to be seeing products likely that have a higher cell count that tend to have less plant protein binder and that do have more of this bite or mouth feel. So XPRIZE is this four-year $15 million challenge uh, that really helps people get towards that goal uh, because it is so hard to create a product that has that bite like a steak or like a chicken cut. So we're very excited about pushing that innovation forward. Really neat, and uh, there'll be a, a clip uh, just uh, at the end of the segment on more about the X Prize um, on 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 food. So fantastic, Kate. While I have you, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna give you a an, I'm gonna pose you an, uh, another question. So, what is what is stopping us currently from having a 100% uh, meat from free from farm and animals? Like, what are, what are the barriers? Um, and can you mention like two or three off the top of your head? Sure, definitely. So when we're talking about products that are derived from animal cells, one of the biggest challenges is figuring out how to feed them in a way that's cost effective. Uh, it's easy to forget how complicated uh, food products are. Oh, Kate, um, are you still with us? Oh, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think I'm still with you. So feeding cells outside of an animal's body is extremely hard. So that's the big challenge we're, we're dealing with currently in the cell-based meat industry is figuring out how to make some of the most complex, expensive parts of cell 
food essentially that normally an animal's body would make. Um, so that's the biggest challenge. And then thinking about how you scale up that kind of process, it's very challenging to think about uh, turning what is currently uh, a very medical, extremely high cost process into something that is food grade and food priced is a, is a really big and exciting challenge. Really, really good. Um, I'm going to go to Bill now. Um, and, and, and Bill, on, on talking about the future of Canada's alternative proteins. So what else do you think we can do to advance innovation in this space in, in Canada? What, what is missing and, and what, do we, what do we need to move forward? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a couple of things. And so, you know, some, maybe I'll start with the investment thesis of Protein Industries Canada. So just so people are aware, we're investing uh, $150 million uh, co-investing with other private sector companies. So we've got a project portfolio of $329 million today of, of active projects looking at the innovation space and everything from plant breeding. How can we use advanced breeding technologies, genomic uh, research to drive outcomes at the other end of the value chain? So looking at things like protein content, protein concentration, amino acid balance, functionality, how can we use advanced breeding technologies to drive that? We're also looking at advanced processing technologies. How can we improve um, uh, processing efficiency? And how can we drive things that are holding back the growth of the alternative protein sector, like taste, texture, and price through innovation? So, you know, a couple things. I think more investment in innovation. This is going to be a sector driven and underpinned by innovative new technologies. You know, Kate was describing some of the issues and challenges with scaling up of, um, of cellular meat. The reality is we need to think about that just for plant-based protein as well. How do we scale up the um, processing technologies? How do we innovate on the development of new food products that are not only mimicking meat, but also creating brand new food product categories? Uh, from, a, from an innovation perspective, maybe close to the consumer side of the, of the equation, I would say three things that we really need to focus on in Canada's plant-based food market. That's taste, texture, and price. Every time I talk to anyone as a consumer packaged goods company, those are the three big concerns or issues or innovation challenges that they need to solve as we work to incorporate more plant-based ingredients into their food product line. So taste for us, that is, um, you know, using yellow peas that we produce at scale in Western Canada, how do we ensure that we're removing that, that beanie flavor? We need a good neutral flavor protein. So there's an innovation challenge for us. I think the texture side, you know, uh, shearing extrusion technologies, the development of, um, of different textures that can be applied in food products, and finally, price. We, you know, in order for this to be uh, widely accepted across uh, across the globe, we really need to drive to price parity with uh, with meat products that are available today. That's all about scaling. That's all about innovation. That's all about technology. So, Philippe, I would say it's those those four things. One is a value chain approach. How do we think about everything from plant breeding to consumer packaged goods and creating linkages across that value chain? and then really focusing innovation on taste, texture, and price. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm custom, uh, consumer acceptability is, is huge, and I'm just gonna follow up uh, maybe, maybe with, um, with you, Nate, about consumer acceptability. Um, you know, obviously the, the trends uh, of yesterday were people uh, eating organic certified foods and really going back to, to nature. Um, from an investor standpoint, what do you feel consumers will think about meat being grown in a laboratory or a, um, a, a fermenter? Yeah, at, at a high level, um, the early consumer surveys are really promising. I know some surveys on cultivated meat range anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of people are uh, have expressed a, a high interest in purchasing cultivated meat products uh, and may, maybe Kate can talk more about cultivated meat specifically but on, on the fermentation side there's that kind of 
uh, you know, these products don't, they're, they're not really for the most part on the, on the mainstream market yet. So we have to look to, to what is on the market and that would be products like corn, which, which have sold really well. So, so well, in fact, that uh, Mondi Nissen, which is uh, the company that owns corn is planning a $1 billion IPO, which is the first billion dollar uh, IPO of a, of a company from the Philippines. So that brand's been doing, doing really well. But you can look to other cultured foods that are having a real moment. I mean, you go to your Whole Foods and you'll see that the, the fermented food section is continuing, continuing to grow. There's now 15 ty types of kimchi you can buy. Um, uh, so, yeah, the, you know, there's also the, the interest, the growing interest in mushrooms. So you can easily tie fermentation to, to the use of fungi, which there's always consumer interest on. And then I guess you, you could look to the really early products that, that are on the market. So Impossible Foods somewhat a product of fermentation is, is maybe the best plant-based meat on the market. Mycotex product I've tried is, is almost uh, nearly as good, if, if not as good. Perfect Day, which uses uh, precision fermentation to produce dairy casein, uh, now has products on the market in the U.S. that, that taste really exceptional. So, you know, the, the, all indications show that they, they're going to be able to compete on, on taste and, and later price. So should, should have mainstream appeal. Great. Uh, I've got a, a question from the, the audience, and I'm going to uh, put this to, to Bill. Um, we've got a question from Benjamin. M mam mammalian cell culture is still relatively labor and resource in intensive. How do you envision this improving, or can we move away from mammalian cell culture altogether? Um. I believe, are you sure that you wanted to put that to me or did you want to put that to uh, I, uh we we can ask Kate if she's there yeah I, I mean I, I guess from my perspective it's it's really all about an underpinning of innovation and, and scale and so for for me it's about um, driving into uh, scaling of technologies and so we see this in in plant-based food production from the crops that we produce in Western Canada. It's, it's all about how do we drive scale and, and that has to come from uh, number one, consumer acceptance because the, uh, the, um, the uh, investments in innovation won't be there without consumer acceptance. There's a, a regulatory challenge here in Canada. We need to think about the regulatory environment that enables some of this technology and if we're going to get mired in regulation on some of these products, the investment from the private sector won't flow. And third is uh, is the investment in, in innovation. I think that the combination of consumer acceptance, a favorable regulatory environment, and, uh, and investment in innovation will, will drive us there. Okay, uh, Kate, do you have anything to add? And I apologize for, for mixing yeah, to, up my, to kind my of questions. Oh, are sure, you there, Kate? no worries. Um, <laughs> I couldn't agree more with Bill. Yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, we can. Oh, tech, it's hard. <laughs> oh, good, okay. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Bill. Scaling is really hard. I think scaling is going to be one of the biggest challenges out there. Uh, getting that price parity with current available options is extremely challenging. Uh, putting that much tech in our food is not something we usually do. So I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge for the field, a really exciting one, uh, but a really large challenge. Uh, to speak a little bit to the uh, consumer acceptance side of things that came up earlier, people do often wonder how these products will be perceived or whether there will be issues with uh, people being interested in eating these products, especially when it comes to cultivated meat or self-cultured meat or lab-grown meat, as it's called. Uh, the names can sound a little pejorative depending on what you're calling the product. Um, and it's a really good point. These products are not yet on the market, so it's a little bit anyone's guess. But I like to think of it a little bit like the Herman Miller air on chair, right? Everyone said they hated <laughs> it. They said they didn't like it. They were really disturbed by the idea of it. And uh, now it's the most popular chair out there. So you know, I, I think it's really hard to predict this sort of thing, even with consumer acceptance studies and tests. So I think I think time will tell. Yeah, I never I never thought of comparing food to furniture, but I guess you know, with consumers, anything uh, anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill, can I can I just tack on a, a small point there? Um, absolutely. I you know, 
uh, just a word of optimism about about cultivated meat scale up. I just want to point out that the first kind of commercial endeavor, first company formed working on that was in 2015, and in the you know five to six years, there are now probably about 70 or 80 companies working on this. And most notably, in the last two years, we've seen a huge uh, surge of companies that are focused upstream in the value chain. So B2B companies like they're working on cell lines or media optimization, file process design, scaffolding, like, you know, having those those vertical entrants or those B2B players will do a lot to help bring down the price. Now, not all the companies have to vertically integrate. So we, we've already seen tremendous drops in, in the price of, of cultivated meat production, even to the point where now, you know, just is able to sell some some cultivated meat nuggets for $20 in Singapore. Um, so I, I would imagine it's, it's going to come come faster than, than people think. Maybe not wow. a steak, but, you know, the patties and things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's. I'm going to push back on that a little bit as the cultivated <laughs> meat expert. So yes. I think it's really exciting. Yeah, I can't help myself. <laughs> I think I think Nate's point is great to the point of B2B technologies. I think those are going to accelerate innovation quite a bit. Makes a lot of sense, allows companies to play towards their strengths. Um, one challenge we do hit is certain biological uh, limits under current tech. So we are going to be seeing, I think, in some ways, certain challenges that are very, very hard for companies to make uh, certain serum free growth media, for instance, uh, some of those tech considerations as they scale are very, very hard to meet. Um, and we have seen some really big drops, especially where they're possible when it comes to pricing. Uh, I do think the devil's going to be in the details as things go forward. And I'm really optimistic about seeing those tech innovations happen. I, I do think it's important to recognize just how much talent and how much enthusiasm and effort it's going to take to get us over those hurdles. Yeah, it's going to require, I'm sure, a lot of innovation and, and, and a lot of creativity uh, in terms of thinking of new ways exactly. to, to solve these problems. Um, we have a, a question from Bruno, and he, he wants to ask the panelists, and I, I'm not sure whether I should direct this to uh, Nate or Kate, but um, you know, I'll ask for, for one of you or both of you to, to volunteer. <laughs> so what do, you, what, what do you think about the use of genetic engineering for optimization of food products. Does that apply? I'll start I'll with just that briefly. One. Oh yeah, please go ahead. And Kate. then I'd love to hear your thoughts, Nate. I'm all for it. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, my apologies. Tech is hard. Um, I'm all for it. I think genetic modification is is a wonderful thing that can help the space a lot. Uh, certain countries, of course, have some regulations around the use of genetic modification, particularly in Europe. Um, but that said, uh, genetic modification has been well proven in other uh, food products such as corn and such that the great thing is that tech is well established, it's safe, it's uh, usable, and the FDA and other agencies know how to work with it in terms of regulation. So of course, cell-based meat will require its own type of regulation, but uh, not all things are going to be as new as people might think. So I'm really bullish about the idea of genetic modification for cell cultured meat. And, and yeah. Nate, anything to add there? I, I would agree from uh, personally, I'm excited about the use of genetic modification, whether it's, you know, a transgenic um, microbe or plant or just the use of CRISPR to optimize those processes a little bit. I would say that um, probably most companies broadly across the alternative protein ecosystem are not using GMO just because the uh, current regulatory environment in certain key markets is, is makes it difficult. Obviously there, there are products that that might inherently rely on that. So some of the precision fermentation, but you know, um, a, a lot can be done just through traditional uh, breeding practices or, or use of mechanical or, or chemical processes. So not as much of this is probably GMO as people might might think if they're new to the space. But yeah, certainly can can optimize those processes with it. Yeah, I, Bill, can I can I can I comment on this? Yes, yes, please yeah, do. I'm I'm so encouraged to hear my my panelists speak in favor of this because it's not been the agriculture industry's experience to have people speaking positively about genetically modified technology or CRISPR or gene editing technology. And, and I am just so excited about the opportunity that it brings 
in a, in a safe and effective format, the ability for gene editing technology with single base pair substitutions, being able to upregulate and downregulate genes, addressing anti-nutritional factors, production efficiency, protein content, like the, the, the opportunity for us to be truly sustainable in terms of our global food supply rests with rests largely with with this technology it is so critical that we that we advance this technology because i, I truly believe it will underpin the future of food wow so i, I think bruno got his uh, great answers there i i'm hope he he's working on a on a, on a generic genetic engineering project um bill i have a question because obviously there are many farmers uh, uh, across Canada and, and uh, worldwide. Um, do, do they see uh, where the science is going as a threat? And mm. how, how do you see us um, closing that, filling the gap for them? Uh, will, let's say, the Canadian government be encouraging farmers to, to look to produce mm -hmm. some of these, um, some of these food, uh, new protein sources? Uh, instead of the traditional dairy farm and mm -hmm. and uh, ranch. Yeah, I, I I think the re so first off, Canada has some of the most innovative, technology savvy farmers in the world. You know, high rate of, of adoption for technology, whether that's um, sustainable farming practices for the sequestration of carbon, the reduction of crop inputs, the safe use of fertilizers and pesticide products. And, uh, and not to mention production efficiency in the livestock sector. So highly, highly innovative farmers. And I, I would say in addition to that, uh, farmers in Canada are highly responsive to market changes. And so really adapting new technology has been, uh, adapting new technology and innovation has been the story and the success of production agriculture for the last century in this, in this country. And production continues to increase, efficiency continues to increase. And so that underpins the success of production agriculture in, in Canada, full stop. Now, the question around the evolution of what is produced on farm, I, I think the reality is as fast as we're going to see markets change at the consumer level, uh, you know, Canada, because we produce such a large amount of agricultural production, both livestock and crops, we will be able to satisfy those market changes with incremental changes over time. I don't foresee wholesale change happening in production agriculture as the rate of plant-based foods increases or the rate of cellular meat increases. The reality is on a global basis, uh, meat consumption is, is projected to rise. Traditional meat production is projected to rise still out to 2050. And so, you know, the, the reality is Canadian farmers will adapt but I don't foresee issues and challenges in, in production agriculture just because of global population expansion and the need for more food. So I, I think this will be an issue that is addressed and changed over decades and generations, and, and our farmers will, will adapt. Fantastic. I, and I know um, I, I uh, acknowledge um, there, there are many farmers uh, out there that, uh, that are truly on the cusp of technology. Anecdotally, my, my wife's grandfather helped electrify the first dairy farm in Quebec uh, with Hydro-Quebec uh, many, many years ago. So that just goes to show how, how far we've come. Um, I've got a question uh, here, um, and I'm just checking the time at the same time. We've got plenty of time, so uh, keep, keep those questions coming. How can, um, so here it is, how can entrepreneurs innovating on plant-based proteins work and get in touch with Protein in Industry Canada? Can you comment on programs, funding opportunities? What's the, uh, can they come in through the front door? How, how do they access you? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So we are a member-based organization. We've got 275 members from across Canada and around the world. I think what's interesting about our membership base is that we really service the entire value chain. So depending on what food innovators are interested in, if they're interested in connections with, maybe it's a plant breeding company because they want some specific trait in a crop that they're processing. If they're interested in conversations with ingredient manufacturers that can supply uh, novel and new food ingredients for consideration in the use of consumer packaged goods companies, 
or if they're an ingredient manufacturer that's looking to make connections on either side of that value chain, we can foster those, uh, those relationships. So I would encourage anyone out there who's interested in a conversation with Protein Industries Canada to visit our website. If you just Google Protein Industries Canada, you'll, you'll find us. We're happy to talk to anybody. Uh, we're in active conversation right now with the government of Canada about a recapitalization of funding. So we're hoping to be investing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars into the growth of Canada's plant-based foods industry over the next number of years. Wow, what an opportunity. So uh, I encourage anyone listening to, to go after it. Um, in the same vein, Nate, um, there are people in the audience that are curious about Blue Horizon and does it invest all over the world or is it uh, strictly in one or two jurisdictions? Yeah, we have a, a very broad mandate. The uh, only place that it's narrow is that we're focused on alternative proteins. So sometimes we'll, we'll go a little bit outside of that in ag tech or, or food tech. Um, we can invest uh, anywhere in the world. We have a global mandate uh, at any level of the alt protein value chain and at any stage of a company. So uh, it's, a, it's a very broad mandate. And uh, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, I think the best way to do that is LinkedIn. Just send me a message. Uh, but if you want to learn more about Blue Horizon, bluehorizon.com is our website. Easy enough. Excellent. Um, so we've, uh, I, I think it's official. We've, we've lost Kate, um, but I've got a couple more questions here. Uh, this one's oh, going back. I think I'm oh, back. Can you hear me? Kate, you're, you're back. Okay. So, uh, again, I'm not sure whether Kate or <laughs> Nate are, 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 okay. Excellent. The, the, the question here is related to microalgae. Um, so why is it that microalgae-based fermentation for proteins is not progressing? Is there scope in Canada for this feedstock? So I do think it's important to clarify. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion around the topic of microalgae and microflora. Microalgae and microflora are two very different things. Uh, microalgae is what you often think of as pond scum. Uh, it's very interesting. The most common form of it is virulina. So that's a very healthy food. Uh, often what people talk about when they're talking about precision fermentation applications is microflora. So microflora is essentially oftentimes a type of yeast. Uh, so these things are, for instance, called aspergillus or trichoderma. And so those are different types of organisms which can be used to make proteins. So it is important to keep that uh, separate in a person's mind. Can I just and tack a little bit onto that? Um, my correction. <laughs> okay. um, so I, I think there's a lot of people who are, who are developing process methods for, for creating large amounts of, of microalgae, and it's still kind of in need of, of a, a place to put it. So, you know, there are companies developing ways to make that taste good, but it just hasn't made it mainstream yet. There's... Triton Algae Innovations has just launched a microalgae burger, for example. Um, so I think more of that's coming, but also th there are some companies that have uh, used microalgae as a, as a vehicle for precision fermentation. So Spira is a company that has developed a blue dye. Um, there's a company called Avectus that, that uses microalgae for precision fermentation. So we, we might start to see a little bit more overlap and, and use that as a, as a production uh, vehicle. Okay, excellent. I think we have time for one and my more. Correction, and just, my, my correction on that point. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'd like to say I misidentified, my apologies, I misidentified aspergillus as a, as a yeast. It is not a yeast, it is microflora. Um, that's what it is. It's, it's used by a number of different um, protein fermentation companies. So All right. thanks for that. No, no, no need to apologize. It went right over my head. So, <laughs> um, what a, so I, uh, there's there's another uh, interesting question here, um, and we're getting into the weeds. Uh, what about the other molecules required for proper dietary, like uh, like you know, as an example, like specific lipids, cholesterol uh, is required for membranes. Any any comments or observations on on that? Yeah, definitely. So I think this is one place where um, cell-based meat can really play favorably. Uh, since cell-based meat involves such custom tuning of so many different cellular processes, 
it's a it's a wonderful candidate for adding different lipids to a type of cells, changing the health requirements of those cells, et cetera. So I'm extremely enthusiastic about the potential for cell-based meat to really transform what we can do with food in the nutrition sector. Great. Nearly I, I, all of that you can, you can either find or express through plants or uh, fermentation as well, I would just add. Okay. Yes, Excellent. Definitely. Excellent. So, so we have uh, five minutes left, and I think I've covered most of the uh, questions coming from the audience. Um, I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, for for the for the group of you, have we missed anything? Like, are, are there any other topics uh, that that were discussed or touched upon today that that we should that we should be aware of or, or explore more? Are there any open open questions still to uh, to demystify? I'll maybe just add uh, one comment that we're still in the in the early stages of this alternative protein revolution, and it's still, I would say, kind of a an all hands on deck moment. So, new data from GFI was just released, uh, the Good Food Institute, yesterday that showed that about I think we have two percent market penetration for plant based meats in uh, U.S. retail. Uh, it's growing really rapidly, but we're still really in the early days, lots of problems to solve along the value chain. So if you're, if anyone's thinking about, you know, did I miss the boat? Is it too late to get involved? We're still very, very, very early. I bet market global market penetration for, for plant-based meat and dairy is, is still probably below 1%. So that's, that's all I'll add. Okay. Excellent. Agreed. Alt proteins are really having a continuing moment. So it's a, it's a great time to get into the space. Yeah, it, it really does feel like we're at the uh, at at the at the cusp. We're at the brink of 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 a brand new generation of of um, of, of of food, but but also of, of technologies that will change our world. Bill, any any last remarks from you? Yeah, I I, I would agree, and um, it's a very exciting time in Canadian agriculture to watch the transformation happen, but. Um, you know, in addition to all of the exciting things we're talking about from a technology perspective, we've got some really big mountains to move in Canada. And I, I don't I don't want to end this on a negative note. I think it's actually a positive thing that we've got. Um, we're going to need an influx of capital. We're going to need some regulatory reform. We're going to need a focus on innovation. We're going to need good entrepreneurs. The, the opportunity for us in Canada, I think we can supply 10 percent of the global plant based food market based on the crop production that we have and the innovation, produ innovative producers and companies we have, it, it's going to move. So we're going to have to move some mountains to get there, but it's a really, really exciting time for Canadian agriculture and food. Yeah, I, I have to agree. And, and it's a great message to send out to young scientists and entrepreneurs uh, in, the, in this conference. It, it truly is uh, really motivating and energizing to, to hear you talk and, and to be part of, of the future. Uh, the, the definition of, of, of the future. It's, it's fantastic.